Well, hello, ISSA. I'm Brian Hoagley, host of Cease for Life and your keynote speaker. I'm asked quite a bit throughout my career and as a practitioner, what does good look like? Now, cyber programs, their goals are often centered around the comparison to sector peers, best practices, and reasonable controls. These terms and approaches leave much ambiguity in an industry that's seeking defined focused expectations on outcomes. While most acknowledge the existence of frameworks like NIST or CIS controls, many programs aren't actually built to them. We see them, but we don't actually use them. This keynote will discuss the pragmatic approach to building frameworks-backed and standards-based cybersecurity programs while not campaigning for purely compliance. It will cover areas required to prioritize within an open framework, govern after its implementation, and how to report its effectiveness to leadership in a way they'll understand the risks addressed. Wow, don't we wish. Actually, a lot of this conversation is going to be centered for business leaders in the audience who really want a solid way on how to address cybersecurity risk in a way they can understand it and implement it for their organization. And everyone knows how much of a fan I am of frameworks and using them, but quite honestly, they don't work for most people. In fact, we really just need to look at risks that are very simple and be able to put in very effective capabilities today while we can to address those things and gaps before we have problems like downtime and ransomware and breaches, brand damage. We're going to get into all of that. So I want you all to buckle up because I think we're going to have a really good discussion. We're going to save the Q&A till the end, maybe even after. You can hit me up then. But I feel like this is going to be a very good conversation for a lot of you to hear and get real about what do you need to do for your cybersecurity program to be able to answer that question. What does good look like? So with that, I'll turn it over to the floor. I'll see you in a minute. Well, thank you, me. <laughs> I'm a lot more comfortable in my studio at home than I am probably speaking in front of audiences. The last couple of years have kind of destroyed that for me. So I'm just going to get my vulnerabilities out now. We're done with that. But what does good look like? I'm not going to do a resume rundown of where I've been and what I've seen. That doesn't matter. You can look that up. But I have heard and seen things from business leaders, cybersecurity experts, cybersecurity non-experts. And this question keeps coming up all the time. What does good look like? Nobody really knows. We can do risk quantification. We can do risk qualification. At the end of the day, we as business owners just want to make sure that we have a business. That's what good looks like. And I am a fan of frameworks. I just sat up here and signed a bunch of books on a book written about frameworks. So I'm trying to not go against what I truly believe in, but I do know that it is too much for some people. It's too much for most people. We need to be able to do better in simpler terms. And that's generally what I'm trying to drive for, is we can overcomplicate everything. You look at ISO, look at SOC 2 requirements, look at HIPAA requirements. You can look at all the requirements. At the end of the day, if you did all of it and everything, would you be good enough? Would that be what good looks like? No, we need to look at risk, we need to look at threats, we need to look at stuff that's actionable today. And good enough is not equal good. I can't get that across, I can't say that enough. You get a lot of people who are just like, this is good enough, are we there yet? I had a CFO at a Fortune 500 I used to work for, he's like, we spent that money, are we done? Like, you're, were you talking to me? Are you kidding? We can't think about compliance as security. and that's a big old thing. We need to think about what is right for the organization, right? And what's right for the organization might be compliance, right? I don't look good in orange. I don't like handcuffs. I don't want to pay fines. So I'm going to follow regulation. That's good. That's compliance that's needed. But there's always something more. And it's never just, are we done? Are we there? Now, you might look at me like, Brian, this is, this is the keynote. You're going to talk over like simple stuff. But simplicity, base capabilities, foundational elements, that's what good looks like. That's what a good program is built on top of. And yet we jump over those things all the time to go for the shiny object, the capability that we damn near hope is going to solve the problems that we actually have today. And I don't believe that's the right course. We skip the things that we need to do now. Anybody a big fan of basketball? 
Phil Jackson basketball, I happened to live in Chicago area while the Bulls were winning championships. I think it was me, but I'm pretty sure it was Jordan and everything else. But Phil Jackson basketball is all about fundamentals. It's like, it's beautiful. Dribble, pass, shoot, simple stuff. No trick plays. But you have to start with something. You, you can't put your finger in the air and just go, this is how we did it last time. That's how we're gonna do it this time. We cannot cowboy cybersecurity. We have to build on something. Now, you can pick something that's lofty and large and extensive. I don't know how many people, weirdly enough, today were like, yeah, we're doing all this stuff on 853. I love that you're talking about NIST. I was like, I'm talking about the wrong NIST that you're talking about. 853 for all my friends in the audience here who do or don't know. I mean, that's a canon of controls, you know? That's great for some organizations. The US government picked it for them. I don't even know if it's right for them, but they picked it and they're using it. But it's not right for everybody. But at the same time, on the other end of the spectrum, a lot of people don't know this, NIST has a small business framework. That's 20 controls. CIS has the implementation groups, one, two, and three. And they correctly figured out and said, hey, small businesses should do small things that are important for them. Midsize should do midsize. Enterprise should do enterprise. Small businesses should not do enterprise security. Yet in our vendor third party risk management programs that from larger organizations, we bestow our knowledge and our, and our requirements on our smaller vendors, we're expecting enterprise class security out of small vendors. And it's ridiculous. Why? Choose something, stick to it, see it through. Choose whatever it is you need to, but choose something. You know how many times I talk to organizations, people are like, we need to build a cyber program. Great. What were you thinking? And why? Why, why did you want to build a cyber program? You got a lot of people who are just like, ah, oh, well, my board's asking about it. Leadership, the PE firm that just bought us, right? Or you've got a customer that's demanding it. Or you've had a regulation that kicks in, you got some type of catalyst. Something is there telling you, you need to do this. Or you're post-post breach. You're in the unfortunate of all circumstances where the digital janitors have come in, cleaned up, and now they leave, and you're sitting there going, I don't ever want to go through that again. What should I have built in the first place? So you have to build on something. And again, if you don't like the foundational nature of the, of the talk, like, I, I would not be bothered if you got up and left. You're like, I want to learn advanced stuff. Most people can't do advanced stuff. And that's okay. Say it with me. That's okay. We can't do the advanced stuff. It's fine. So it doesn't matter what you use. Just as long as you use something, point to it. It's a nice little get out of jail free card when you really think about it. Hey, I didn't come up with this. NIST did. ISO did. Blame them. I'm just following what they wrote. It actually works in this space, because if I turn around to any organization, it's like, well, what did you build this on? Oh, I built this program based on this framework. Oh, interesting, yeah, very good, very good. You know, the XKCD comic that's out there that we all know and love, the world doesn't need a 15th framework, right? So use the ones we already have. Now, the good thing about frameworks that I'd like to nerd out on is that they're basically all the same thing. Nobody wants you to actually know this. BSI, who owns ISO, doesn't want you to recognize that the ISO framework looks a lot like NIST, and the guys and girls at NIST don't want you to know that their framework looks a lot like ISO and other ones. They're all basically the same thing. My team and I, we've mapped them all and crosswalked them. There's very little deltas. So what does that tell you? A lot of the smart people in these different silos have all figured out what good looks like and written it down, and then they just put their marketing stamp on it and said, here, use ours. So again, use something. It's all there. Stop building programs to, this feels right. A lot of organizations still do that. It's not going to get you anywhere. You're not going to be able to build and mature from that. You need to be able to identify your risks. Risk means a lot of things to a lot of different people. NIST has a definition. ISO has a definition. 20, I could pick randomly 20 people in this audience right now. They'd give me each a different definition of what risk is. So I'm just going to talk about it in this sense. You have basically two things to look at. Again, simplicity. I like to look at attacks and outcomes. Let's make it simple. I want you to be able to leave here today and go, Brian, I can do one of those things that you talked about in your keynote. I have done my job. I have made ISA, ISSA happy, and they will probably invite me back. 
When you really boil it down in the cyberspace, there's about three things. These are the first two that happen from an attack standpoint that really matter. Phishing, you might not have heard about this, but people, bad people, send fraudulent emails to good people in your organization and try to get them to do something. It's wild. It's, the, it's, like, it's an old con, right? A lot of cyber, cybersecurity is not new. Can we also just agree on that? Like, we grew up out of IT, and now we all think we're cool because we grew up out of IT, because we're the special wizards that all know the cool stuff and no one else does. We're not, we're not that cool. We're just IT guys and girls. But the bad guys are just different branded versions of long and short con men. You look at what they're doing, it's all the same thing, and it's just in a digital form. And now they just do it at scale. That's the only thing I think in this, or, in, in this industry we're in that we can actually point to and say, yes, they are correctly doing something at scale. <laughs> application security. All the IT infrastructure that we have out there runs applications, runs services, ports protocols, all that fun stuff. And we expose it because we need it to be exposed so that we can get our customers to interact with us or our vendors to interact with us. And some of the stuff we make is insecure. <gasps> no. But it all, honestly, just leads back to unauthorized access. When you really boil it down. Now, if you're gonna stand up here and do the whole, well, actually, Brian, and we're gonna go have that argument, just save it, I will have that argument with you later. Yes, there are probably more things that are on this side of the screen that should be attacks. But realistically, this is kind of what we're dealing with. And if you think about it in these types of terms, more simplistic terms, addressing the risk actually becomes a possibility, which is what we want. We want a fighting chance on the defense side of things. These two actually lead back to this. So while these three areas are the predominant things that cause us pain, those two themselves lead back to unauthorized access. So if you think about things in, this ter in these terms, you're like, okay, I can get my hands wrapped around this. Now what does this, what does this do when this happens? pretty much leaves you with business email compromise. Again, bad people are sending you fake emails to try to get you to do stuff, which I just love. Like from a, I should have been on the other side. I should not be wearing a suit. I could have made a hell of a lot more money. I know a couple of us in here have thought about that, doing the bad thing, but we're good people. We should stay being good people. But damn it, they figured out how to just be like, here's an email, wire this money over to that address now. Okay, cash in hand, I'm like, oh my God. Billion dollar industry. There's an ROI on the other side of this. No one, no one knows. In the DOD, we used to track when these people went on vacation. They have health care. They have benefits. This is not some kid in his mom's basement anymore. This is some kid in a multi-story building with a corporation centering around them. They have ROIs. They have KPIs. They have objectives. They have to make quota. Where's my salespeople at? The bad guys have quota too. There is no Q5. <laughs> Sorry, I had to steal something from Corp. Um, data exfil, your data is going to leave. And ransomware, we're going to shut it down. What is the definition of cybersecurity? It plays out right here. It's the triad. We are fighting against and trying to maintain confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And that's how it manifests when it goes wrong. But Brian, what about the people? You've talked about this tech stuff, it's great, but what about the people? I don't like to put people in the boxes, but I'm going to. I generally believe in the Jahari window of things, and I'm not going to do a really bad impression of Rumsfeld when he did a very bad version of what the Jahari window looks like about known knowns and unknown knowns. But I look at it through this quadrant. You have good people do good things, yes. You have good people that do bad things. You have good people that do stupid things. And then you do have bad people that do bad things. Now what does this mean, right? It's competence, incompetence, insider threat, and malicious actors. These are basically how people are, are structured in an organization and kind of where they fit. This is what you're thinking about when you're thinking about dealing with the human that's using the technology. And there's different things you need to do against each of these. Good people doing good things, you don't have to do a lot of stuff. In fact, whatever it is you are doing, keep doing that. 
keep them good. These slides will be available later, sir. Good people do bad things. Why do you think we do that initial credit check on people when we hire them? Anybody ever scratch their head why we don't do that quarterly on people? The US government does for people with clearances. They check in on you, why? Because all of a sudden now I'm $100,000 in gambling debt and those guys over in Russia are offering me a way out. All I gotta do is give them an admin username and password. Actually, it's not that bad. We've seen, we've seen the, the, the memes and the videos on the street, people giving up their password for a gift card. That's like, corporate espionage just lost to like, some girl with a camera shooting a TikTok saying, what's your dog's favorite, or your dog's favorite food? What's your dog's name? Oh, where did you grow up? Your mom's name, what was that again? Oh, okay, cool, boom. Good people do stupid things. Yes, unfortunately, good people do stupid things. We have to, this is what we need to protect against is down here. And it's not they're stupid. They're either lazy, they are incompetent, and you've hired them, but they're trying. But they're also not techno wizards like us. They don't know anything about most of the stuff that all of us in this room actually understand. Business people do not understand IT. That's why we all have jobs. And I think if we can all kind of stop trying to expect everybody to understand what we know as security practitioners, this whole thing would be a lot easier in cultural change and adoption of cybersecurity practices in organizations. That's huge. And that's, I think, stemmed back to a lot of, I'm a cyber expert, I know everything, boom, 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 why aren't you keeping up? We, there's no expectation that anybody who doesn't have the roles and the experience we do has that. Do you know why I have a CFO? Because I can barely read a P&L. I'm not supposed to, I'm the CEO. I'm supposed to listen and trust him when he says, this is what we're doing, this is the forecast. I'm the accounting and numbers nerd, Brian, not you. I'm gonna explain it to you in business terms so you can make a decision about the company. Thank God. CFOs do that for their CEOs. Cybersecurity professionals need to do that for everyone that we work with. I can't stress that enough. And then obviously bad people do bad things. Yes, we knew bad people do bad things. Google a number of years ago, God, it's gotta be going on 10. Where's my Googlers at? I signed like three books for you guys. Did you guys just get my book and leave? They did a great little study. At 5,000 people in your organization, you are guaranteed a foreign actor. That means there is one person out of 5,000 that is working for you, you're paying them, but they're also working for somebody else. That's, that's easier to understand at an enterprise level. When you start getting in mid-tier organizations, I always get this response. Oh, we only hire good people. No, 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 we don't have people like that that work here. Really? Why do people get charged with embezzlement and fraud at small, mid-sized businesses? Non-IT security related, like just embezzlement, moving money. We can't think about that. We have to have business people understand a little bit better about the fact that you can have bad people working inside your organization. You need to do something about it. You need to protect your organization even from your own employees. We might even need to start adopting a concept some have been throwing around called zero trust. <laughs> I tried, I tried to do it with a straight face, I'm sorry. <laughs> but where do you start? Again, I like simplicity. Prioritization for what you're trying to protect. A lot of people will just say, we need to protect everything. Do you have a money tree in the backyard? If so, can I come over? Yeah. Prioritization is incredibly important because you can't protect everything the same. You don't have infinite resources to be able to do it. So you need to start thinking about what you can protect based on a few things. And I'm gonna give you these four to start with. What makes me the most money? If you're a nonprofit or you're a state or a municipality, you are looking more at civil and societal impact, right? That's your prioritization. Or actually, revenue generation. You do collect taxes, right? How do you protect that that still happens? How do you protect to make sure that the things that are reducing your costs are protected? How do you have some level of customer connectivity? We lose the, the customer's trust in us through our applications. We lose our customers. And what is our brand? And how do we protect that? If you look at the systems in your organization and you backtrack from these four things to the systems that are, enable these four things to happen, there's your prioritization. 
20 years ago, we used to do this thing called DR and BC planning, and we nailed this down. Everybody remember that? All those horrible exercises, but we were so glad we did them when we were done because we came out of it at the end going, yes, this thing cannot have any downtime. And who had the conversation with the CFO or the CEO or the business leaders? Raise your hands, I want to see this. When you had that initial conversation, old school heads doing disaster recovery in BC, and you said, we need, to, we need to prioritize what we're going to protect. They said, oh, well, we need to, everything needs to be back online. And then you showed them the bill for what that would look like. Who has done that? Yeah, I'm proud I've had that conversation. Because it's like, yeah, sir, uh, that's literally what's gonna cost if you wanna do what you just said. And they're immediately like, oh, no, I was kidding. <laughs> we want to bring that system over there up immediately, everything else can wait like a day, and you're like, that's the bill. Two days, that's the bill. We could probably wait a week on those ones, that's fine. <laughs> you've had those conversations, you've seen that, or you've played that out in your head and you wish that's how it went. But that's happened, and that's how we need to think about security from a prioritization standpoint. Why we, most of us dropped doing the whole DRBC thing, because we built so much relevance and culture and importance behind that concept and adoption to it. And then suddenly, when all of us security folks stepped out of the, the quagmire and emerged as our own practice and sector, we forgot that that happened because that's what IT did. Here's the secret. There's no such thing as cybersecurity. It's just good IT engineering and architecture. We should learn and lean on what the CIO and their teams are doing. In fact, most of the stuff that we want to see gets done happens in their shop anyway. So we need to be adopting what happened out of there. And you need to protect the things that matter the most. I have talked to so many organizations that are like, yeah, we've got to protect all this stuff. It's like, but that system over there literally makes you a million dollars a quarter. These don't. And you want to keep them all up? You want to protect them all with the limited resources? Why? Again, simplicity is going to win in your you know, adventure and journey through trying to get other people to understand why you can't sleep at night, why you are so concerned. And I applaud all of us because I believe you're in this profession for a reason. You are mission oriented, you have a protection mindset, and either you came out of military and law enforcement and you have that, or you were just that kind of good person that doesn't want to see bad things happen to good people. That's why you're doing this. And that is commendable. And that is a trait that I wish we all had. But we need to start thinking about only being able to protect the certain things that we can. We actually need to have an acceptable amount of loss. That's hard for a lot of folks who want to make sure that everything is up and protected. But we need to. So I'm going to go into something that I'm sure is going to make some people uncomfortable. And that's going to be okay for all of us. It's not going to be okay for me. But when we think about kind of like a moment of FUD through all of this, to make it real, I had to bring a real opportunity into this conversation to get at, well, why do we have to protect these things the way that we do? How do I get my point across to folks? And I purposely waited to putting this next example in to two weeks before this conference, because I knew that the world would give me an issue around security that would prove my point and discussion about the importance when you build something, you're charged to protect it. Now, it's unfortunate it's this example. Recently, we have a war breaking out, another one, in the Middle East, where a terrorist group has attacked a people and caused pain. This is not political, but these guys did just make it political to me. Anon Ghost. Hopefully nobody cares about what I'm about to say, but these particular bunch of assholes have decided to take on a app that people in Israel depend on to be notified when rockets are being sent inbound. We've created a good app with good intentions to protect people. We unfortunately didn't protect the application itself, and some jokers decided, these guys have a long history of doing bad, bad things. But this one in particular, I find right there on the lines of attacking hospitals and schools, but they have taken out an application 
that is giving people a protection, an ability to stay safe. There's no blame to be laid around except that these people chose to go make this happen. But the point is, we have an application, we have a capability that we have moved into society and said, depend on this. This will help you. You could look at things, where's my new municipalities, my state and city and county government folks? You provide clean water to people. You take wastewater away. You provide electricity. You have societal things, civil things, that people uh, rely on to survive. How do you protect those systems? Finance, same way. We have banks, how do I access to my money? There are certain things that we give people as customers that they depend on that is kind of near life supporting. We have to protect those things. So it's an unfortunate, but I think it proves the point of where do you prioritize? When you think about it, this turns into what you prioritize. The thing that either I'm here because I'm protecting people or I'm providing a service or whatever it is. That's how you need to think about prioritization. If this went down, what does that bad day look like? Once you build the program, once you think about the risks, how do you govern it? This one always cracks me up. I meet a lot of GRC folks, and I'm a GRC wonk, so I'm happy to say this, who don't actually think about the governance aspect of the GRC. They're like, we're gonna identify a risk, we're gonna be compliant. Okay, well, how often do you actually govern the program you built? Does the thing that you put in on day one still work on day 300? How often do you look at it? What does that cadence look like? It can be very simple, but it's yet ignored. It's like, oh, well, we did that. It, a lot of cybersecurity is not set and forget. Good programs are built on standards and frameworks. Effective programs are continuously managed and led. You cannot just set it, be like, good, we did that. We'll check in on it next year. No. It's like with my dog, no. Please, no, stop. We're gonna train you to think a little differently. Governance centers around the execution on the strategy. You did build a strategy, right? You didn't just jump into the tactical implementations and elements of a security program. You just thought about strategically, what did you want to accomplish? Everyone here has done that, right? You're all part of organizations who are thinking about strategic alignment to your goals. Okay. That's important, and yet it's skipped. And it doesn't take a lot of work. You have to establish your accountability. You have to have some type of decision-making hierarchy built in. You can literally start this with a calendar invite. I've done this with so many organizations. Quarterly, first Tuesday of every month, from 10 until 12, we are meeting and discussing these things. Start there. If you look at your own organization, like, when do we regularly review X, Y, or Z? We don't. Start with this. Okay, we're gonna start a program. I've had so many clients and folks, we just did this in the DOD before we could get people to really adopt it too, even in a Fortune 500. Calendar meeting, right? My old deputy from uh, Fortune 500 sitting right over here. Calendar invite, let's just set it up. Let's make sure we talk about it. Let's carve out the time. No, you can't miss this meeting. If you're sick, call in. Remote work is okay. It was 10 years ago, it still is now. But do it, that's important. It can be easy. And it doesn't end, that's the other point. It never, it never ends, you have to continually govern what you've put in. How else would you know if what you put in is still working, today, tomorrow, whenever? I'm going over these things because I hear so much feedback from organizations and whenever you see me talk about the stuff on CISO Life and my YouTube and all of that, the reason I talk about those things is because I had a conversation that was the catalyst to make me talk about that on go, oh, I have to do a video on this. I have to actually talk about this. Wow, that's interesting. These problems still persist. It's the simple things. It's the foundational things that are hurting us. Now, how do you talk about it and to who? There's a couple different audiences. And they want something different from everybody else. Your board, they want to be able to give you support, but they want the support for their decisions. That's how you need to talk to them. Do not talk to, and you'll get that out of the gate. You're gonna to talk to the board, Brian, but uh, you can't talk technical. Yeah, thanks, no kidding, not my first rodeo. Got it, but I'm glad you pointed that out, which means it's that important to you, which means it should be that important to all of us when we talk to the board or the C-suite. What you want is their support and their money. 
So you need to convince them of those risks, and the prioritization helps you convince them. That's a key thing. You can't just go and you're like, we need to implement, I'm sorry, I'm going to pick on a DLP solution because it's the first one that popped in my head. Sorry, DLP vendors. Uh, we need to do this. I need a million dollars. You can't just jump to tech. You need to talk about like, oh, well, data exfil is a real problem for us. Why? Because we have and allow for unauthorized access because we keep getting popped. Phishing is, is becoming a predominant uh, issue, blah, blah, blah. You need to back it up. You can't just say, we need to justify this, this vendor, this product. Use everything else to justify that vendor and product. You want the CTO and the CIO support resources and their trust. We still have this battle that happens between the CISO and the CIO. You know how I know? Because the same article keeps popping up in dark reading and everything else says, what's the CISO's reporting structure and why shouldn't it be to the CIO still? It's like, who cares? Nobody cares. It should be, do you report to somebody who knows what they're doing and are they a good manager? That's what matters. It doesn't matter if the CISO reports to the CIO, the GC, the CEO, or directly to the board. Do you have a job? Good. Are you effective at it? Good. That's the point. That's what you're supposed to focus on. But yet we still have this combative kind of thinking about how security needs to be completely separate from IT. Again, we're not that special. We need to kind of get out of our heads and thinking that way. Your customers want trust, and you want them to trust you. If that's not leading most of what you're trying to do, I, we need to talk about possible career changes. And that's okay. Like, I've made career changes because I was like, Ooh, I'm not good at that. We're going to go over here. And from your vendors, you want better services and capabilities. It's okay to want that. It's not okay to give all of your vendors a thousand questions demanding enterprise level security of them. If I see one more Excel spreadsheet asking the same set of questions and I can't point to a program that I have and they can just take that as evidence, I'm gonna lose it. Who's tired of that stuff? Yeah, nice, I love this, two, two hands up. We need to better talk about what our programs look like to our customers so they trust us. We need more transparency in that. We need to lessen the paperwork that happens when we are demanding trust of our vendors. We need something simpler. Because I'll guarantee almost, I'll, I'll, I'll make a bet with somebody in here that most people don't actually look at a lot of those answers. It's like insurance applications. Is everything filled out? Good, here you go. We did all this analysis on you anyway, that you're a 25-year-old male driving a red sports car. So thanks for filling out the app. But that was just a paper exercise. We actually know what you look like. Here's your rate. Seriously. We need to think more about that when we're dealing with vendors, right? Am I at the end? Am I already there? I am. I thought it was a good journey. I thought we learned a lot. I'm glad we did this. I do, honestly, I, I you know, I'm very passionate about uh, this space. I, I have a lot of hope for what we can do based on what's required and asked of us as professionals. And I know everyone's gonna keep working on doing that. And I hope more people we can bring into this profession. We can show the next waves of students and career changes and vets that this is a great field and that we are a community and that we are building something and we are working with each other and we are collaborating to do the right things. Because our dependence on technology is not going away. And it, the day it does, we're in a whole different world. Anyway, you know, most of us are gonna have to go figure out actually how to start a fire, but we're not there. So our dependence on technology is there, which means we are needed and our expertise is needed, but we need to be better about how we share and use that expertise. We need to work more within the business we need to help the business. And with that, I want to thank all of you for this time. I hope this is useful. The slides will be available. I want to thank, again, ISSA. I think this is a phenomenal event. I've just learned about this in the last year, and I am blown away by what the Southeast has to offer, what this organization has to offer for everybody who has come out. I want to thank you all again for your time taking a day away from work, your family, and being here with us. I will be uh, doing Q&A later. Uh, there's a session and I will be here for the rest of today if you want to stop and talk about anything.
please, uh, please hit me up. So again, thank you. Enjoy the day.